Okay. Yeah, so Ashley Howe, so Ashley uh, received her uh, bachelor in plant biology at NC State in 2014, her master in horticultural science in 2018, and uh, she's currently in her second year of PhD in horticultural science, and she works on pineapple genomics, and she will present uh, the progress of her work so far. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Yao, and today I will be talking to you about a phased chromosome scale genome assembly for pineapple, Anonis camosus variety camosus. So, pineapple. We all know that it's delicious, but why else do we care about it? It's the third most economically important tropical fruit in the U.S. Um, only bananas and citrus, bananas, uh, only bananas and citrus are purchased more in the U.S. and pineapples are third. It's also an excellent source of vitamins and digestive aids. So some of the vitamins are listed here, including potassium, calcium, magnesium, et cetera. And then uh, it also contains a compound called bromelain, which I'll go more into in just a moment. So pineapple is a diploid organism. It has 50 total chromosomes, so 25 per haplotype, which are pictured there in that little colorful image. It is highly heterozygous, and it has an estimated genome size of about 526 megabases. Uh, there are currently two available genomes, and those are for the varieties F153, a canning variety, and MD2, which is the main fresh fruit market variety. So to tell you a little bit about some of the genomes that are currently available, um, I'm going to lay a bunch of statistics on you right now, but I will explain more about what they mean in just a moment, but memorize all these numbers. <laughs> um, so again, the estimated genome size is about 526 megabases. For the current MD2 genome, the, can, uh, the fresh fruit market variety, um, that total length is about 524 megabases, so it's almost 100% of the total genome. And it's, it's contained in about 8,500 scaffolds with a scaffold in 50 of 153 kilobases. And it has about 22,000 contigs in, uh, with an N50 of 57 KB. And again, I'll explain more about what all this means in just a moment. Um, but for the canning variety, uh, we have a genome that's only about 72.6% complete, and it has about 3,000 scaffolds uh, with a scaffold N50 of 11.7 megabases, so much larger than the MD2 scaffold N50. And it has about 9,000 contigs as well, and um, with a contig N50 of 114 kilobases. Um, so again, much larger than the MD2 genome. However, both of these genomes are highly fragmented. And so the implications for some of this research, um, we need a high quality genome in order to study traits that are agonomic, agonomically, ag agronomically and nutritionally important. Uh, so yeah, you need a high quality genome to study those traits. And some of those traits we're interested in are flowering time. You can see down here that we have some mature fruits as well as some plants that still have flowers on them and no fruits yet. Um, so this is referred to as NDF or naturally differentiated flowering. Um, that's characterized by asynchronous flowering. That's one of the issues that pineapple has uh, for production. We're also interested in looking at bromelain accumulation. So I had mentioned earlier that pineapple has digestive aids in it. Well, one of those is bromelain. It's a proteolytic enzyme, and it actually helps reduce inflammation in your digestive system. And uh, it's also used as a meat tenderizer. So uh, I like to tell people that when you eat pineapple and you kind of like feel that sensation on your tongue that kind of hurts a little bit, like in a good way, but pineapples are the snack that bites back. Uh, so that's bromelain affecting the tissue on your tongue. It's, it's doing that proteolytic, proteolytic activity. 
And also we're interested in understanding stress tolerance. Um, so pineapple is a CAM plant. It's highly tolerant to drought stress, but you know there's other stressors like biotic, abiotic, drought being one of them, but also flooding uh, and things like that. Uh, which brings me to the objectives for my, for my research. Uh, we would like to, or we wanted to, create an improved chromosome scale genome for the pineapple genotypes MD2 and Dole 17. So again, MD2 is the fresh fruit market variety. That's what you'll buy in the grocery store when you buy a fresh pineapple. Dole 17 is from our breeding program. It's an advanced selection, and uh, it actually has tolerance to that NDF trait that I had mentioned earlier, so it doesn't have uh, as, bad of, as bad of problems when it comes to flowering all at different times across the field. And our other objective is to improve gene prediction on these genomes. So. Earlier, I had told you about all these contigs and scaffolds and scaffold M50 and contig M50. Well, here's a good diagram of how to explain what that actually means. So you have your genome up there at the top, right? Well, when you give your samples to a lab, they send them through the sequencer. What you get out of the sequencer is reads. Um, so these are actually kind of little cut up portions of DNA. They're just like little pieces of the genome. You have to match those up together to create contigs or contiguous sequences. So these here, you've laid all these on top of each other, matched them up, and now you have contigs. Well, when it comes to getting those contigs, then you just have a list of them. You don't know what order they're in, but you need to place them together to create your larger scaffolds. And the big difference between the contigs and scaffolds is they're all pasted together, but the scaffolds will still have gaps in them, uh, whereas the contigs are contiguous sequences and they do not have gaps. Um, but going from this process of having contigs to getting scaffolds, uh, that's where this high C technology comes in. So that's, that's where we're going to use our high C data at. So to kind of give you a, you don't have to like memorize all this or anything, but to give you just a very brief explanation of how high C works, basically you have a tangled mess of DNA. You know, it all, it looks like a, a tangled rat's nest of hair or something. So um, high C technology actually takes advantage of DNA proximity. Um, so it, you'll take this mess of tangled DNA and you cross-link it together. And DNA that is closer together will have more cross-linking happening. And uh, then you cut it up with a restriction enzyme, you ligate it together, and then what you end up sequencing are the ends uh, that you have ligated together. And so that is kind of how you can tell like which ends of which contigs actually go together so you can make your larger scaffolds. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to present you some statistics for the genomes that we've actually assembled for MD2 and Dole 17. So Dole 17 isn't quite as far along as MD2. We started off with MD2 because that's the main fresh fruit market variety and we already have a genome for it that we can use resources or that we can use the resources from. So um, we have two genomes. We uh, used Falcon Assembler to assemble uh, MD2 the first time and then we used Falcon Unzip which will separate out those haplotypes because remember it's a diploid so we have two haplotypes that need to be separated. So um, what we got uh, for the primary assembly uh, which are the most frequently occurring contigs, the associated ones are like variants of the primary contigs so I'll just present the primary ones but we got 892 that uh, contained about 536 megabases of data, so slightly overassembled, but that's okay. And uh, we got a contig M50 of 1.5 megabases. That's a greater than 26 fold improvement over the contig M50 from the previous MD2 genome, because you remember that one was like 57 KB, it was small. And so for our Dole 17 genome, we got about 2,500 contigs. 
Uh, this one was much more over-assembled. Uh, we're still kind of working out, like, d doing the Falcon unzip assembly for that, so that way it will properly phase those out. But uh, that came out to 683 megabases with a Contig M50 of 784 KB. So not quite as large as the one for MD2, but again, we're still hashing that out. And uh, so now I'm gonna present you our MD2 genome that's actually scaffolded. So before I had pre presented you some contigs, now we actually have scaffolds and we've scaffolded it to the chromosome level as well. So phase zero and phase one, those stand for our two different haplotypes, so haplotype one and haplotype two. We have 63 contigs in both of those and so that includes 25 fully assembled chromosomes, and then, you know, some extra contigs and scaffolds that weren't quite placed on those chromosomes properly. But, yep, 63, much lower number than, uh, like, 8,500 scaffolds and 21,000 contigs. <laughs> and uh, that came out to about 556 megabases for um, the first phase, or for phase zero, and 541 for phase one. And then uh, our scaffold N50s are 24.3 megabases and 23.7 megabases. That's a greater than 158-fold improvement over the scaffold N50 length for the previous MD2 genome. There you go. I mean, our genome is just, it's just better, you guys. It's just better. <laughs> Um, so this is the SSR marker collinearity. So SSR is, uh, it stands for simple sequence repeats. Plants have a lot of those in their genome. And uh, so we took some markers from uh, one of the previously um, created linkage maps and uh, we did a collinearity analysis for those for our genome versus the previous MD2 genome and um, or their previous position on the linkage map and so the x-axis is it basically shows you the position on our genome and then the y-axis is the position on the linkage map. So this first one up here on the top left, uh, you can see it's, it's not very collinear. It doesn't look very good. Um, so what we're actually working on now is creating some of the breaks in our assembly so that way we can fix some of the misassemblies. Um, so the reason it's not very collinear is because we need to actually um, change up some of the misassembled contigs and scaffolds that were pasted together that shouldn't have been. Um, and then for this second one, we believe uh, that this middle part that isn't very collinear, we believe that might be due to some centromeric repeats. Um, so it can be kind of difficult to get over some of the repetitive regions around the centromere. And so we're working on that as well, creating some breaks in our assembly and then reassembling it and seeing if we can't get it to just get, get together and look a little bit better, look a little bit more collinear compared to the previous linkage map. And then this last one here on the bottom is a good example of one that actually looks good. Um, there's a couple little spots there that we might need to, you know, break and fix. But we think this one, this is a, this is an example of kind of more of what we're going for as far as like when we look at this collinearity plot. And so to give you a little bit more of the high C data, um, these are interaction heat maps. And so this is basically you've, you've taken those um, high C reads that you've sequenced the ends of your contigs and you align them to your genome. And um, so this one here on the right is actually the high C data for MD2 aligned to itself. And so this, this one actually looks good because you can see most of the red is contained here in this diagonal in the middle there. We have a little bit of like kind of plaid looking pattern here, um, which we believe we may be able to fix, you know, once we like make those breakages and stuff that might actually clear up a little bit more. Um, whereas this one here on the left, this is the Dole 17 high C data aligned to our MD2 genome. And uh, so you can see here there's a lot more red going on. And so the red indicates interactions between genomic regions. So essentially, you can say that 
this region of the genome is interacting with this region of the genome. And so that's um, why we want this diagonal to be, or the red to be, just along the diagonal because you're basically saying this piece of the genome that is biologically next to this piece of the genome is interacting more with, you know, than, than with a piece down here. So I hope that makes sense. If you'd like to talk more about high c data and like understand more about this graph, I'm happy to talk to you about it afterwards. And so now what? Uh, now that we have these, or this scaffolded MD2 genome, what's our next step? Well, we can actually use this genome as a reference to scaffold our Dole 17 genome. Uh, so that way, we hopefully won't have to pay phase genomics to do it again. Uh, yeah, so we'd like to try and, you know, take a, take a try at that in our own lab. We have a very good bioinformatician. And uh, for then we'd like to do some gene prediction, and for that we're going to use PacBio IsoSeq. Um, so if you're interested in PacBio, um, I'm very familiar with that technology as well, and I love using it. I've done IsoSeq prediction, gene prediction before, and it works very, very well for a high-quality genome such as the one that we've created today, or not today, but the one I presented today. And uh, so for this IsoSeq project, what we want to do is we want to get a very comprehensive set of genes, meaning we need to get genes from all the different tissues in pineapple. And so these tissues include leaves, roots, flowers, fruit, the meristem, and also the hypocotyl or stem, whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, these are some of the images that I have already taken uh, collecting tissue in the lab. And so right now I'm in the process of making IsoSeq libraries to send to DHMRI and have sequenced. So just to give you a recap, today I presented you a new chromosome scale genome for the fresh fruit market variety MD2. I also presented to you a new high quality genome for Dole 17, still in the works. It'll get better, but it's already very good. And also, I've told you that we're going to do some gene prediction with IsoSeq, so stay tuned. And using all of this information, we can uh, use these to better understand genomic mechanisms that are behind the important traits in pineapple that I had listed earlier, such as flowering time, bromelain accumulation, and stress tolerance. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge these people. That's our bioinformatician that's so good, my PI Massimo, and all of these people who gave me money. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> yes. Should I? So I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that pineapple, I'm from Puerto Rico, and I actually, my town, we have a lot of pineapples. Great. So uh, I know the punch bag very well. Mm -hmm. um, it's really good. Um, so you said it's a third fruit um, in, in terms of consumption, yes. I guess. Yes, yes. Um, so why do you think the genome, the annotation of the genome was not necessarily well done yet. Like, I know you're trying to make it better, yeah. but why compared to, let's say, bananas uh, or other fruits, why the mm -hmm. genome was not as well annotated as yeah. you had mentioned? Well, so, I mean, everybody loves pineapple. It's super popular lately. And uh, there have actually been some gene prediction and annotations and things done on the genomes. and. Um, I mean, we do have two genomes available already that might not be super good quality. So like all of this has been done and the reason we want to improve on it is because we just have the new technology available to us. So yeah, these genomes, the previous genomes were assembled using a bunch of different technologies, including PacBio, Illumina, Moleculo, um, back reads, like they used everything and still like it none of that data came out to you know make an assembly as good as what we were able to make just because the technology has improved so the genome's got to improve welcome yes um so hi see the question since she did 
Oh, um, she asked, is high C a, a relatively new technology or has it been around for a little while? Um, so there have been some technologies like 3C, uh, like chromatin confirmation capture um, to, to kind of understand like how the DNA is interacting with itself and with uh, pieces of DNA both close to it and farther away. So it's not necessarily like a new, new technology, but um, high C is a new newer technology that has built off of 3C and um, high c has actually been around for a few years but now recently again they're like improving algorithms they're making kits like they're designing kits that you yourself can use in the lab um, so like I generated all of this data whereas before you would have to send your tissue off to someone and have like dovetail make the library and then do the high c analysis and everything so it's not necessarily new new but our ability to use it more um, and use it better is new and constantly improving. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, so that picture I showed was just a very small picture, um, but a lot of the time when you go to a pineapple field, if they haven't sprayed, like they have to use hormones um, to regulate their flowering time to prevent them from flowering and then spray more hormones on them when they're like, okay, we're ready for all of them to flower. So um, the process of pineapple flowering in a production setting is very highly regulated with hormones. And um, so wild pineapples will just kind of like flower whenever they feel like it. Stress, um, I mean, it's a combination of stress, plant weight, probably like some starch accumulation and things like that. So they have a lot of different requirements that go into what makes them flower or what makes them not flower. I wouldn't want it. Yeah, what I've noticed uh, from growing pineapples in the greenhouse is that they'll flower under the right conditions and they'll flower under the wrong conditions. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. With your work, are you going to Sorry, with your work, are you going to sequence like like reduce complexity sequence like a bunch of the varieties to compare them and to kind of look at your gene? Um, so we do actually have, we have five varieties uh, right now in the greenhouse, and so I have been collecting tissue, so those isoseq tissues I showed you, we're doing the gene prediction right now on just MD2, but I've collected those same tissues for five different cultivars um, that are kind of along a spectrum of tolerance uh, and susceptibility to NDF. Um, so we probably will end up doing something with those, like some differential expression analysis, like comparing mRNA levels or something. So uh, we have the tissue and we're, we're saving it and now we're just kind of trying to decide, you know, what, what do we want to do with it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you.